Our presenter today is Mark Taylor, who has worked as a supply chain consultant for many years. He has a raft of experience in a variety of sex sectors and is a tutor on BB849. I will now hand you over to Mark, who will tell you a bit more about his background and best practice in supply chain management. It's over to you, Mark. Super. Thanks very much indeed, Janet, and good evening, everybody. Uh, it's nice to, to meet you in this environment and to take a little bit of time just to talk about supply chain management and what it might mean to us as managers in different businesses and organizations. We're actually just coming towards the end of the first full presentation of this module, and it's been an incredibly rewarding experience, not, not least because the material has been very good and very insightful, but the feedback we've had from a lot of our participants has been really excellent and I will share some of that with you as we go through this presentation. Some of it I think is stuff that you'd expect around the quality of the material and the practicality of the learning points. The one or two surprises as well but I'm going to save that for a little later on when we talk about for example the supply chain game. Um, so I'm going to run through my agenda. It took about, in practice it took about half an hour but I've added in one or two other little examples so if it, you know five or ten minutes either side of that uh, I think we'll be fine. Please do feel free at any point just to sort of chip in with questions or comments. Um, I certainly have pl plenty of examples from my experience of working in supply chain management. Some of them good, some of them bad, some of them quite humorous, which, which I'll share with you. Um, but if you have examples too that, you know, please do, if you just want to sort of maybe pop your hand up and I'd be very interested to hear your experiences and interpretations. Um, so as Janet said, I mean, I've really been doing this type of work really all my career. And it started off working in the spirits industry in the early 90s uh, for, for the firm that's now Diageo. So if you imagine uh, a relatively sophisticated production process, mostly centered in Scotland in the production of whiskey, um, being distributed all over the world. And if you think about you know, the cost of a bottle of whiskey, what's involved in the logistics and the transport and so on. And for many, many years, I think we just did it relatively intuitively. Uh, and as supply chain management became sort of increasingly recognized as a discipline, there was a realization that we probably weren't terribly efficient. And, and so supply chain, our first supply chain management project was born. And this was the early 90s. Um, more recently, and I'm talking as recently as five years ago, I, I bumped into an old colleague from those days who's still with that company. And it sounds to me like they're having exactly the same conversations we were having 25 years ago, um, so, or, or maybe perhaps even longer, longer ago than that. So um, it, it begs the question, as businesses, as organizations, as managers, are we good at supply chain? Are we effective? Are we efficient? And so on. And I think one of the things I like about this, this course and the webinar we're going to have tonight is just going to ask us one or two of those questions. I'm not going to deep dive into a lot of detail, but I will share with you not just examples, but one or two course concepts I found particularly useful. And it may be just you know, quite helpful for you to sort of take these away and just, just reflect on some of the points and some of the questions that come up. Okay, so as I say, you know, allow for about half an hour. If it, if it goes on a little bit longer, if it's a bit shorter, that's absolutely fine. But there's plenty of time at the end if you have questions or you know, even if you want to just share some examples of your own, I, I'd really uh, look forward to hearing those. So here's our agenda. We'll start off just by looking at uh, supply chain management in context. Well, what, what do we actually mean by supply chain management? When you, when you hear those words, what do you think of? Or what do you, what do you sort of visualize? So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And then I had a couple of examples. These, these are really to start with just a couple of personal examples <laughs> from uh, my own experiences as a consumer actually recently, which I thought were, actually, were quite illustrative of, of the nature and some of the challenges of supply chain management. And then we'll lead on to sort of uh, from there to discuss well, why study supply chain management? What, what might you get out of it? What might be the learning points? And I'll, I'll give you, a, a, I think, a relatively brief overview of the course. I'll highlight some of the content that I thought was particularly interesting. And of course, if you do have specific questions about any aspect of that, um, you know, please do just ask. Uh, one of the highlights of the course, and I think one of the, uh, the key learning points was the supply chain game, which has been called variously the, the baked bean game or the beer game, which is obviously quite a popular title. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, for me, it was really a pivotal part of the course. I think we really got the superb learning out of it, and it was good fun. Challenging at times, but good fun. 
And then really, you know, plenty of time at the end if you have questions or comments you'd like to share, experiences, or, or just an open discussion about contemporary supply chain management. There's, there's plenty of time for that. And finally, if you, you know, if you'd like to find out more, just you know, what are, what are the next steps? So I hope that sounds like a good way to spend, you know, the next, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and as I say, please do just chip in at any point if you have any comments or questions. So. We mentioned you know, supply chain management in context, and what do we think of when you hear that phrase supply chain management or SCM? For a lot of people, um, you might think of the traditional production line, whether it's cars, whether it's printed circuit boards, whether it's I don't know, food production, but we might think of a factory really going along at full tilt and um, striving to achieve the most uh, efficient unit costs and, and maintaining uh, the optimal level of quality and so on. So we tend to think very much in terms of traditional manufacturing models. And I think this is actually a, an image from, if you're familiar with the automotive industry, the River Rouge plant in Michigan, North America, which is uh, uh, probably the uh, epitome of traditional supply chain management thinking. And it's a, it's a good part of our uh, course content as well at the start really helps sort of set the scene and gets us thinking about you know the traditional manufacturing models uh, of supply chain management and things like vertical integration which is you know for many years has been I think probably the dominant theme of supply chain management thinking but we need to move on from that because the world has changed the structure of the economy has changed you know, in the UK now I think manufacturing you know, certainly accounts for, for I think less than 30 percent of the economy. So let's think about the service sector, let's think about the public sector and other interpretations of what supply chain management actually means. And I think one of my favourite examples is, you know, is fashion. And you think about well, the vagaries of fashion, uh, how subject it is to seasonality, to weather, to whims. You know, so, so David Beckham or you know, some sporting icon is seen wearing a particular garment or a particular item of jewellery. And that has huge implications. People want it, well, not just now, they, they, they kind of want it yesterday. So think about how fashion supply chains work these days. They need to be very, very responsive to, to changes in taste. They need to be very, very price competitive because a lot of people will shop online and use price comparison, comparison websites, etc. They need to be ethically sourced as well. And that's a, a, an increasingly important part of supply chain management. You may remember a, a few years ago, Nike was singled out for its use of inappropriate labor in some of its Southeast Asian factories. Uh, whether that was fair just to single out Nike, I don't know, but they, would, they seem to bear the brunt of it. That had implications for their reputation and for how well their overall supply chain performed. And I'm, I personally, perhaps I'm a bit of an optimist, I personally think the concept of the sustainable supply chain, the ethical supply chain, has taken off, it has taken hold. For, uh, certainly in, in, in developed economies, I think we have an increasing sense that we are, are doing the, these things quite well. So not only have we got to balance the vagaries of demand, we've got to take account of other consumer preferences and pressure from governments, from regulators, etc. They're all part of, of uh, what goes into supply chain design. We might then sort of think about public sector and healthcare. Okay, so I don't know, you have a little accident not so long ago, I broke my wrist playing football, I go to the hospital, you know, I, I expect to get serviced relatively quickly. But then you think about the complexity of healthcare in the UK, you think about the different needs from, you know, idiots like me that fall over playing football to people with more serious and complex conditions, you think about their the care that they need from different medical professionals, you think about the medication they need, the machinery, it's incredibly complex. And probably more than any other sector, and I'm thinking particularly in the UK economy, so subject to public scrutiny, so subject to, I suppose, political wrangling. So it's an incredibly difficult environment in which to manage a supply chain, or, or multiple supply chains, we should say. Uh, but again, these are the sort of things we, we explore towards the back end of the course. And, and I, I, I want to get people thinking about pretty much everything we do is part of a supply chain. Okay. Some are relatively simple, some are far more complex. And I think one of the most complex examples right now, and particularly relevant, think about disaster relief, humanitarian supply chains. And we've had a lot in the news recently, with, you know, various hurricanes and earthquakes and various disasters. They happen quickly. They tend to be, but they're often unscheduled or very, very difficult to predict. What needs will you have? 
what resources, what supplies, what manpower, people power will you need? When, where, how do you deploy it? Who coordinates that supply chain? You do hand it over to the Red Cross or Medicine Sans Frontier. Is it a government responsibility? There's a lot to think about in that. Draw your own conclusions about whether you think we globally are effective at humanitarian supply chains. I, I tend to be quite optimistic about it, but I also suspect there are deeper complexities involved. So what we're coming down to, and I think the, the sort of conclusion here, is that I think pretty much everything we do is part of a supply chain. So here we are uh, on a Thursday evening, and well, one way to interpret this current situation is we are in a supply chain. Now, let me give you my interpretation, what quite simplistic interpretation of our current supply chain. So the Open University is probably central to it. There's me in the middle, a tutor, and Janet will be in there as well. Uh, we have a de delivery mechanism, which is this uh, OU Live. We have student strength managers, and, uh, we have uh, alumni and, and other attendees. So that's basically what our supply chain looks like. But can I ask you, would anyone, is there anything you would like to add on to that? What else goes into this supply chain? I've identified, I think, five key steps or key nodes in that, or links in that supply chain. What else do you think should be in there? What are we missing? Now, if you're a sophisticated OU Live user, what you can do is use the little text tool. So let's say somewhere in this process, I might want to mention, for example, the library. Because that's clearly part of the process, because a lot of our materials come from the library or are managed by them. Perhaps that fits in there, or somewhere around here. What, what else would you put in? Perhaps, perhaps somebody would like to comment. So there's a Mark. Mark has said there needs to be feedback from the customers. Yeah. Absolutely, feedback. So the idea that a supply chain is <laughs> goes in one direction is an important one, an important constraint, and there should be a little process there. One of the things we talk about in supply chain management is the idea of flows, so products flow, relationships in a sense flow, information flows, money flows through a supply chain. And I think what Mark's picked up on there is this idea with the information, what we're trying to do is customise our offering to make it as relevant and useful as possible to our students and managers and alumni and so on, whilst also being consistent with best practice academically and you know, best practice in industry terms. So yeah, absolutely, feedback from the customers, you know, the, that part of the information flow. Any other thoughts, guys? Anything else that you feel should be in the supply chain just now? Feel free just to annotate that document if you if you know how to do that, or, or perhaps put something in the chat box. Okay, Jack and Chase, yes, yep, machine. Yes, I mean, so often we've had uh, situations um, mm -hmm. whereby you try to complain about something, and yep. you're told that, oh yes, we're going to take this into account, and then you go back and try the company again, and exactly the same thing happens. So. <laughs> They're clearly not tracking and tracing. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. So let's capture that, track and trace. I should point out I'm probably pretty terrible at typing on this. Uh, but, so Mark's also said uh, limitations, a bit from stakeholders or regulate. Yes, yeah, so there, there are regulatory implements, certainly. So as you well know, the OUMB is triple accredited. But that comes with certain stipulations and certain requirements of how we sign and deliver our courses, etc. Okay, <clears throat> so there are other things that could go, certainly go into the design of this supply chain. Um, there was one thing I felt um, I added uh, after I'd done this you know, initial first, albeit relatively simple draft, but I, I'm actually, I would question whether the participants of whether it's a webinar or a full course or I mean anything that the OU delivers, is that the end of the supply chain? And one of my thoughts is, well, actually, no, because our student managers, but actually, they go hopefully, and they put this learning into practice. And this has been one of the great pieces of feedback we've had from our first group of participants on BB849. People saying things like, you know, we looked at this particular model. I went and had a conversation with my colleague, with my boss, with my team, 
and it prompted a productive conversation. We maybe went and had a conversation with our suppliers, actually. I've got a couple of examples to show you, to show you shortly, specific examples of that type of feedback. But what was interesting for me is the supply chain didn't end where I thought it ended, and, and that's the sort of reflection that I think uh, studying a course like this prompts us to, to, to undertake. Okay. Um, does that make sense so far, guys? Any, any other comments or observations before we move on? Okay, well, as I say, feel free to chip in at any point, and thanks for your, your input on, on that exercise. So, I wanted to share with you a couple of course concepts and a, a couple of experiences, as I say, of my own, uh, my own experiences as a, as a consumer, and comment on what I felt this uh, might teach us sort of from a supply chain perspective. So, on the right hand side, we have a piece of furniture not dissimilar to a piece of furniture which is in a room in my house, which was purchased a little while ago. So it's kind of a coffee table with a, a little storage underneath uh, where you can put like, board games and magazines and uh, well, my kids put all sorts of monstrosities in there, usually when we've told them to tidy up. Um, now, where I've highlighted the catch book, I should say this was a self-assembly. It was from a, what I consider to be a very reputable high street furniture retailer. Um, I no reason to doubt otherwise, and, and you know we paid I think a, a good sum of money for this, and the catch broke. So this little front panel sort of flaps out, and you put your games and newspapers and so on in, and then you close it up, and it's you know nice and neat and tidy in theory. But the catch broke, which is just on the inside here. Now we <laughs> phoned up customer service. They said, oh, yeah, the catch is broken and the thing's not shutting and it keeps falling out. And instead of sending us a new catch, guess what they sent us? That's right, a whole new piece of furniture. So not only did I have to <laughs> take it apart and you know, take the catch, and, you know, in theory I should have had to reassemble the whole thing. Um, in fact, I think the first time around we did have to send the thing back. And oh, you know, if, you, if you're like me and you don't like putting together uh, furniture and flat pack and everything else, oh, I was not impressed with this. Now, let me relate that to some of the theory. You may be familiar with the idea of supply chain as being lean. So this is all about getting production as quick and as fast and efficient and slick as it possibly can be, driving down that unit cost, and just really getting it you know, as, as lean and, and uh, efficient as it can be. The kind of other end of that spectrum is, is what you might call agile, which is the ability to respond. So I always think, you know, I always think of fashion supply chains as being pretty responsive. You know, to changes in weather, to changes in fashion and whims and whatever celebrities and other opinion leaders are, are doing. So agility is about, also all about responsiveness. Now this is probably, in my opinion, probably the least agile supply chain I can imagine. This catch would have cost, I don't know, three quid. The unit, I didn't say it was 200 pounds. And this catch can't have been more than three pounds. But they had such poor control of their supply chain. I got sent the whole thing and had to send everything back and rebuild it, and it was just incredibly ineffective. What made it worse? What made it worse was it took about nine days to come. So not only was it not agile, it wasn't lean either. And I think this is probably, for my money, this probably is the contender for the least lean or agile supply chain that certainly that I've ever experienced. If you have an experience, you know, please do just type it into the chat box or share it at the end because I, I'd lo I love hearing examples of this. Now, we also, um, because lean as a concept and agile as a concept are often presented almost as sort of absolutes, the reality is we're on a bit of a spectrum and when we think about supply chain design, what's right for your industry? There's a nice little model called Fisher's model that helps us determine you know, where do we fit, not so much in these absolutes, but somewhere on a spectrum in between. So legal then becomes this sort of this sort of portmanteau. That's what we're trying to do is get the balance right between lean and agile. Uh, so Mosin has just shared an example. He has, yes, yes. I, I wonder if it's the same bed company I had trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not mentioning company names we here, are guys. Not. I think. We uh, are not. Um, but <laughs> they sent a whole new bed after almost a month. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to hear more. Thank, thank you for sharing that. But it's surprising, isn't it? You know, because this is the business they're in. Um, you know, very often some of the companies they work with, they say that we, we're just shifting boxes here, 
and <laughs> they're so focused on that efficiency, you get these crazy situations where you end up with a very unsatisfied customer. They've incurred costs. I've incurred time and frustration. If I was mean-spirited, I would probably have <laughs> done them some reputational damage, but I, but I guess I forgave them. Uh, Lillian, you're, you're, you're saying Dell is very agile. Did you have a, a, an example of an illustration? Or I think you're right, by the way. Well, we wait for um, Lillian to type her yeah. answer. Um, I actually had an issue um, with the company um, just supplying a necklace to me, and they ended up giving me a huge discount of about 30%, which must have really eaten into their profits. Mm -hmm. So. The Lillian has come back um, to say that they build the computer to order. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think I think that's a really good example. And um, we have we have this phrase um, which sort of balances uh, this idea of mass customization. So you you can order a new car, but you can have it customized as well. So that seems to me to to be a good example of legal. And I think I think most major manufacturers can do that now. But yeah, thank, thanks for that, Lenny. I think that's a really, really good example. Uh, so there's, so I've got one bad example. Lillian's cheered us up with with a, a good example. I have one more. Um, now, this course, we we talk, uh, and anyone that sort of studies supply chain or any of the articles you read, you're likely to hear about the bullwhip effect. Now, what this is basically, if you think about, you know, here we are, customers at the point of sale, deciding on, you know, which brand do we buy, which product do we buy, etc. Now, sometimes there are very good reasons behind our purchases. It could be to do with an advertising campaign. Uh, it could just be to do with you know what our, what our peers have done, our, our friends, neighbours, etc. Sometimes it's just a little bit random. And I did quite a lot of this work in the spirits industry. And to some extent, we could uh, filter out seasonality, we could filter out structural trends. But there was always a little bit of noise, you know, a little bit of day-to-day -day variation in demand. Now, what can happen? If there is a little bit of a blip in demand at the customer level, retailers might, oh, this product's taken off, I'll order a few more. So they order a few more, and the distributor sees this, and oh, this is popular, they order a few more. Then you go to the manufacturer. By the time you get to the manufacturer, demand has been, become magnified, rather in the way that if you crack a whip, well, this is the kind of pattern you get. So this is the bullwhip effect, and it's, it's really quite common. And what tends to happen, the manufacturer then gets overwhelmed, can't supply all the distributors, all the retailers, etc. And so there are backlogs of orders. Customers then get frustrated and go somewhere else. And when the order comes in, then um, you know the customers have changed their mind or gone elsewhere or switched brands, etc. And it's a very common problem. It's very, very well documented, and it happens, you know, you know, at industry level, at country level, sometimes. It's a very common phenomenon. Now, just recently, <laughs> moving to this bizarre picture here, I've. Um, you probably won't be able to see the price, but I, I, there's a picture of me with a, a sort of silly grin on my face because I finally uh, bought myself a cast iron frying pan for about a third of the marked price. This was about 25 quid. And I've wanted this frying pan for probably, well, certainly all my married life. We were supposed to get one as a wedding present in 2000 and never did, and I, I just never bought one. And literally a couple of months ago, I saw one on special offer reduced down to from about £90 to £25. And I went into the shop and I said, you know, how come these are so cheap? And, and the lady that was behind the counter said, oh, do you know, when these first came, they were so popular, we couldn't get enough. And, you know, we ordered in lots and then, oh, they were, they were out of stock. And, oh, then eventually they all came in and now nobody wants, you know, so she, <laughs> she virtually described the bullwhip effect. And I'm pleased to say that having, whilst I suffered um, at the hands of the furniture retailer, I got a, a real bargain here. So I actually bought a, um, a cast iron casserole dish and a, and a frying pan for literally a third of what they would have been. And that's kind of what happens. Okay? That's the kind of thing, if we don't manage demand carefully, and if we overreact to these little nuances in demand, these little blips, it can magnify down the supply chain, creating a bullwhip effect, um, and everybody suffers in the end. Okay? And that's one of the major major challenges of, of effective supply chain management. Okay, again, you know, please feel free if you have any thoughts, just maybe type in your good examples, bad examples, etc. But if you saw the rest of that picture, I've got this silly grin on my face, and my, well, my wife said, why on earth do you want a picture of you holding a frying pan? And I said, well, I've got, I've got a webinar coming up on supply chain management, and I explained the bullwhip effect, much to her chagrin. 
she, she was sorry she asked. So there you go. Anyway, that's, so there's a couple of examples of some of the course theory. Yeah, absolutely. It's good for the consumer, you know. So, so the, I suppose the consumer was a winner in that case. So, a couple of examples there. Um, so, just to move on then. So, what? Why do we need to study supply chain management? I've highlighted some of the challenges. Why is it so important? And I'm going to put a couple of points to you. Actually, um, firstly, I mean, pretty much everything we do is part of the supply chain. It was only really when I thought about this webinar that I thought, yeah, no, this is a supply chain. Uh, you know, you go, you go and get a cup of coffee, part of a supply chain. Um, you go into work, you're somewhere in that supply chain. And, you know, uh, we're using electricity uh, to power our laptops and we can have this webinar. Somewhere, somebody's mining coal that's then used to generate power, without which we couldn't have this webinar. You know, so so when, you, when you map out your supply chain, you learn something about the efficiency of it, the, the role, you know, how complex it can be in practice, where the strengths and weaknesses are, etc. And increasingly, competition takes place at supply chain level. So it's not just company against company, it's supply chain against supply chain. Those that are the most efficient to market are probably those that are going to win in the long term. So if you might think about, I mean, one of my favorite examples, you think about Starbucks. Now, there's a lot of great stuff about Starbucks. In my personal opinion and experience, the coffee's OK. It's not amazing. But what they have is a brilliant supply chain. There's plenty of other good coffees out there. But what they have is that ability to select the right outlets, to get the product there on time, to produce the product at the right temperature, at the right level of consistency. Okay. Sounds easy, um, maybe for an experienced barista it might be, but there are challenges to getting that right, and a lot goes into the design of the supply chain and the overall process that makes a difference that enables the comp them to compete so successfully. And, and to, you know, to use a phrase, you know, as businesses, organisations, we're only as strong as our weakest link. You have a weak point in your supply chain, then that's what you, that's basically the main constraint that your company faces. Okay. So we've got to get this right. We've got to look at supply chains. Um, I, I, you know, I work with companies quite a bit in this field. You'd be amazed how blinkered some companies are. And you said they're so focused on what they do day to day. When I can take them out for a day or two, map out that supply chain, say, right, let's look at those suppliers, let's look at those distributors, and just broaden our perspective. Sometimes you see where the weaknesses are. And it's not in-house. It's with the suppliers or it's with the distributors or some point in the supply chain that we may or may not have control over, of course. Uh, and, and a point, I've, I've, I've included a quote here from the course material. Um, many businesses may think they're good at supply chain management, but it's far from static. And what we think of as proven solutions are challenged every time an impactful event renders them insufficient or useless. Expected or unexpected events, good and bad, occur on a daily basis. Okay. Now, think about your own organization, your own business. What is it that can happen that can really upset the apple cart, that can really disrupt the supply chain? Okay. Um, every business has a weak point. There are very, very few businesses that are perfect. Even those that we think of as being really rather efficient and rather uh, successful, they have their weak points. And I'm going to take a cheap shot, guys, partly for entertainment value, but partly because I think it makes a valid point. So here's my cheap shot. Okay. Do you remember? No, it was only a few short years ago. You, you remember, I hope, the horse meat scandal in the UK. Now, this was part of a complex supply chain which involved, I think, a, a French food processor that uh, sourced goods from, from Romania and, and from uh, like Cyprus, I think, yeah, from all, all over the world. They didn't know what was in their food. Okay, so I think it was Aldi, Lidl, and Tesco were distributing products that contained horse meat. Now, whatever your views are on the subject, you know, I mean, it's, it's no different really from beef as, as far as I understand. But we were absolutely shocked, horrified, disgusted, <laughs> nauseated because we were eating horses. And it, it bothered people on so many levels. I'll level with you. I got a lot of mileage out of this. I got a lot of mileage out of it because it was on one level, it's quite funny. On another level, it's really alarming and shocking. The fact is, though, um, what do you think the, the real business implications were? So you may have a bit of a joke about it. And I appreciate this is, this is slightly tongue-in-cheek, slightly a, a cheap shot, this example. What, are the, what do you think were the main consequences commercially, 
of the horse meat scandal? Personally, for me, Mark, I'll wait for everybody to to put what they think in there. But it was the um, uh, sort of l loss of trust in these companies. Yeah. You know, um, you feel you know what's going into your food. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Stuart says loss of confidence. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Reputation damage. I've seen saying quite common here. People just so I missed that one. Yeah. Yeah. In Holland, yes, yes. Holland, I mean, yeah. People do want to know what's in their food in Holland. Yes, we do. Think we want to in in the UK as well. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a really interesting point, Stuart's made. You know, this just wasn't just about beef. You start to wonder what you know. What else is in there? Other products. Um, I think that's a really, really interesting point. Now, at, at the time, I, from from memory, the um, the value of the industry, you know, beef. Beef products in the UK, I think, between sort of fresh meat and processed meat, was something like three billion pounds at the time. Okay, and then when you take that lack of confidence in well, beef and, and beef-related products, there has an impact. Demand will fall. People lose their jobs. Okay, so suddenly we realise there are quite serious implications to this. One could, of course, argue they'll switch into other products and it balances out, etc. It's still not a nice thought. It's still not a comforting or ethical way. It would seem to do business. And the Stuart says, you know, you might start thinking, well, what about these other, if you think about the retailers? Can we really trust them? If they don't know what's going into their products, then we begin to question our confidence in them. So, and I'm just looking, Stuart's got a point there, a very funny occurrence when the owner of Iceland went on TV and stated they did not test for horse meat, so they would not have no but also did not test the dog or cat. <laughs> PR manager nearly had a heart attack, yeah. So um, <laughs> that's, just a, that's just a great example of, of the value of PR. So, um, or the, the, the damage. Yes, I happen to remember that quote as well, yes. It, it was yeah. rather amusing. Yeah. Not quite proper, though. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So Arjun's saying, is there a distinction between companies that actually market their SCP? As an overt USP, such as DSL, and companies such as Tesco, where they want to de emphasize the supply chain, sh uh, short farm to fork with assurance of source, and sort of efficient behind the scenes. I think that's a really, really interesting point. And it's something that I think does come out later in this course. I, I think you, you're absolutely right. I mean, sometimes you might want to really trumpet an ethical supply chain, an efficient supply chain, one where, you know, the, the farm to fork, you know, the, the, the sort of food miles is reduced. Um, I think companies that do it well will probably want to do that. Uh, I suspect <laughs> companies that don't play it down. I think that's a, re I think that's a great question. I, I really do. And uh, again, something we can explore to some extent in in uh, EB849. Okay, well, well, we'll we'll trot on, guys, from this uh, example. Uh, and apologies again for a, a low shot, but, but it really is a, it really is a serious issue, as you said. And, and um, you'll see other examples in the course material about your milk supply in China was another one, uh, but there, there are plenty of examples out there to consider. I know, terrible pun. I, oh, you sh a couple of years ago when this first came out, come out, I mean, I had an absolute field day with it. I, I just made up these puns. I just made it up on the hoof. Sorry. <coughs> so the other reason, why is bloody supply chain management? Just to remind you, so everything we do is part of a supply chain competition takes place at that level. We're only as strong as our weakest link. And we're still, frankly, we, we all have a lot to learn about it. The other thing for me, and uh, one of the other things I do for the OU is teach on the strategy module. And if you've done strategy, if you've done, uh, we have you know, the dynamics of strategy, or a course like that, you'll be aware that implementation is often the weakest part of strategy. So we have analyzing, choosing, implementing. Implementing is where we're pretty weak. Now, it could be said, it's, you know, effective supply chain management really is at the heart of implementation. It's kind of the backbone of the company. And it goes right through from the initial R&D and product development through purchasing and production, sales and marketing, distribution and logistics, and so on, you know, into the customer's hands. And, of course, as was pointed out, we would have a feedback loop as well, uh, sort of track and trace type of, type of operation. So, Arguably, supply chain management really does provide that link between the top level strategy and what actually happens, our ability to implement that strategy. Okay, so I think that's, that comes across, again, quite well in the materials. I'm, I'm conscious of time, guys. We've, we've been going 
just pushing half an hour, so we're running on a little bit, which I hope is okay. Um, I wanted to, to just cover some of the course material. I'm not, as I said, going to do a deep dive here, but there's a few things I really, really wanted to highlight, which I found you know, personally of particular interest. And so we start off, as, as you'd expect on, on a course like this, you know, just defining supply chain management. What does it mean? And it's not just about the big factories, you know, pushing out cars, printed circuit boards, food manufacturing. It's pretty much everything. And that's an important sort of starting point. Uh, we start thinking about supply chain performance, and there's lot, lots of ways we can define performance, efficiency, and so on. I think what, one way I like to think about it is fundamentally, and what we all think just a simple manufacturing operation. Um, if you are supplying products into shops, you want to maintain, you want the highest level of supply possible. You don't want any out of stocks. You want your customer to be able to get their product as and when they need it. So you would stock high. So that gives you good customer service levels, but a high inventory cost. Okay? If you're primarily concerned with cost, what you really want to do is keep you is get your production as lean and efficient as possible, get your suppliers really to hold as much stock as possible to get your distributors to hold the stock and bear that cost for you. So you've got a trade-off between the cost of the materials at different points in the supply chain and the service level you deliver. Just that simple balancing act can take up a lot of time and, and just getting that bit right is a real, real challenge for companies even today. Um, we talk about supply chain design, okay, and we've got these two basic models of, of kind of lean and agile. Um, historically, and for many years, the, the, the notion of vertical integration was dominant. So there we are, we're a manufacturer. Well, we have certain inputs. If we can control those inputs, uh, then it gives us a bit more control over the supply chain. We should be able to operate more efficiency, efficiently. We then think about our distribution, and if we can control those distributors, then we've got as much control as possible. And that's the driving logic of vertical integration. And, 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 and arguably, it still stands up today in many industries. But increasingly, there's a counter-argument. We think about outsourcing, which has been a huge theme over the past 15 years, or really. So the idea is, instead of saying, well, actually, you know, we will do everything ourselves, if one organization becomes a specialist in, whether it's distribution, whether it's in a part of the production process, whether it's in support services, if they're a specialist, they get the economies of scale, the economies of scope, etc., which they can pass on. And that makes supply chain design a lot more interesting, a little bit more complex as well. Okay? So that's the sort of thing we explore there. Now, I'm guessing you want to hear a little bit more about this supply chain game. Uh, that will come in the next slide, I promise you. We learn a lot about the mechanics of supply chain in the supply chain game. But it's easy, you know, this point in the course, to forget, really, Perhaps the most important thing in the supply chain is those relationships. Let's say you've got a rush job. You need an order fulfilled really, really quickly, and therefore you need to deliver it quickly. Can you pick up the phone at five minutes to, f to five to your supplier say, John, it's Mark, I need this. Look, I know it's last minute. I know we normally take 48 hours. Can you get this to me? Have you got that relationship in place? Okay huge part of it, okay? So increasingly, we think about the human elements of supply chain relationships. It's not just a zero-sum game. It's not just a sort of, a, a, you know, almost like a competitive master and servant type relationship. The argument is if we build constructive, productive, mutually beneficial relationships, we will get achieve better supply chain. I was just pausing. Uh, Mark, I think you had a question there, so, or comment. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you raised this point. So Mark is saying SCM needs to work in partnership with suppliers, else there's a danger the supplier could walk away or go bust. Absolutely. I have more to say on that. And I have a couple of examples of where that's absolutely true. And also a couple of examples where the supplier or the, 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 the client company doesn't actually care what happened to the supplier. So again, yeah, I, I think that's, that's what I would, would, would hope to achieve. Uh, but we also we can explore that in a little bit more detail also. One of the biggest questions also is, is you know, who carries the risk? Uh, a lot of the smaller companies I work for, when we really look at it, they carry a lot of their client risk. So they may be happy to do that, maybe because they're really specialist in that particular part of the process. Are they comfortable with it? Are they getting rewarded and remunerated for it? Interesting question. 
Yeah, a really nice example there, which Janet's just put in supermarkets not paying farmers enough for milk. Uh, absolutely. It's just, okay, we as consumers, we get a huge, what is it, two litres of milk per pound. What, what, you know, what is that, what are the implications for the supply chain? What does that mean for farmers, etc.? Are there risks to the, the, the cattle, to the, you know, to the livestock, etc.? There could be all sorts of implications to that. Um, cost and financial issues, absolutely. We talk about cash to cash. We start with cash, we buy inputs, we process the inputs, they become outputs, we sell them. How long does that take? And it's, it can be amazing. Uh, if, you, if, you've, if you're familiar with the concept of the working capital cycle, it's, it's that kind of idea. How long is our money out there? Okay, so that's one example of what we study. It tends to be a huge focus for, for companies right now, and, and probably always will be. I'm just looking at Moshin's example. Yeah, uh, plus they are not allowed to export outside of Europe. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that goes back to that earlier point about sometimes regulation, uh, political factors can have an imp impact on supply chain as well. And then finally, just, just lo a look at um, sectoral studies. Okay, so we look at, we, you know, we start thinking about, for me, the, the real eye-opener was this idea of humanitarian supply chains. I really hadn't thought about it in that level of detail, and you know, the complexity of a famine relief operation or a disaster relief operation. All the key stakeholders involved can get incredibly complex complex and, and you know it's the ultimate price the ultimate measure in its people's lives being saved um, so for me I think that's a, a particularly interesting exciting area okay. now I was going to tell you a little bit more about uh, the supply chain game I'm going to cover that just now uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about it but basically you're a, you, you've got a role play okay you can be a retailer distributor manufacturer etc You've got three basic products. One is baked beans, which are relatively easy to shift. Demand is relatively stable. It's got a high shelf life, etc. So what are the challenges in managing the supply chain? Well, <laughs> you might be surprised. It's slightly harder than you think. Now, I'm not going to give the game away, because if anyone does go on to do this course, you will find out for yourself. And you start off with baked beans, and maybe, maybe after a while you say, I'm gonna, instead of being a retailer, I'll try this as a distributor or a manufacturer. And you learn something more those different perspectives. And once you've got the hang of that, okay, what about something a bit more challenging? We look at cupcakes. They're comestible, they have a lower shelf life, etc. And again, you can be the retailer, you can be the wholesaler, the distributor, etc. And then something, you know, perhaps the ultimate challenge, ice cream, massively seasonal, uh, quite competitive, um, subject to fluctuations and variations in demand, changes with the weather. Okay. So you've got all those things to do. You don't have to do them all, but you can do two or three different um, different roles uh, for two or three different products. Now, what's been really, really exciting about this is not just learning about the technicalities of supply chain management. How do you deal with nuances and variations and even lurches in demand? How you deal with those is one challenge. The really nice thing, the really nice feedback we've had on this is people saying, actually, I learned something about myself as well. Okay. And I was one of the people, I should say, when I first did this, something I learned about myself, I was surprisingly stubborn. I had a strategy, and I stuck to it, and it didn't work. And it continued to not work, and I continued to stick to my strategy. And I had no idea I was so stubborn. And there were some interesting points as well. Um, I, as I say, I don't want to sort of give away too much, because everyone's learning experience is different. But my belief is, my belief is, that you will get not just a technical uh, learning outcome from this, but you, you will potentially learn something about yourself, the way you make decisions under pressure. And that, for me, is an extremely valuable learning point. Okay, So it comes about midway in the course. For me, it's, it's kind of the highlight of the course, to be perfectly honest. And it is, it's frustrating on occasions, but it's very, very good fun. And we have very good feedback on that. Um, a couple of quick points. I just wanted to share with you a, a couple of other points in the course material. Uh, Arjun's come in again. So end users may want to minimise inventories, must produce unrealistic pressures on upstream. You've done this before. <laughs> am, I, am I right? Have you had some experience of doing this, or is this just your perception based on? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I'm going to cover up your answer then. So, um, but absolutely, you know, you you do learn these these sort of. Um, 
these sort of test technical aspects to. And you know what's funny? Going in, uh, I know myself. I, I think I know this, and I still made plenty of mistakes. So plenty of learning points. Thankfully, no one has to. You don't have to show all your outputs to everyone. You, you just show the best ones to uh, to your colleagues. So that's an overview of the course. You know, we cover a lot of good ground here in it's about 22 weeks in total. Uh, Nine on, the sort of nine online sessions, roughly two weeks each. Uh, but for me, you know, just just cracking content, really, really valuable. And the best feedback is, you know, this is not only sort of academically robust; it's kind of up to date with uh, what I think is certainly best practice in industry. And people were saying, you know, this is practical. I can take this away and do stuff with it in my job now. I can start discussions with my boss, with my colleagues, with my team, with my suppliers. Customers, so very very practical outcomes. I'm going to show you just quickly a couple of the tools that I really liked. Well, we talked about supplier relationships here, and you know I think uh, I, I certainly um, agree with the idea. What we're trying to do here is develop relationships that are. You know, Mark had made the point earlier about you know, the, you know if you're not working in partnership, uh, you know the, you, you, you're potentially damaging the supplier, and you can shoot yourself in the foot. But think about that relationship um, ranging from simple transactions, you know, you just pick up the phone and place the order, maybe you just order online, and you never think about that relationship through the different stages to really a full supply partnership. We're in it together, we're partners, you know, competing at supply chain level. So this is a, a, an interesting model. It's uh, you know it's, it's described as a continuum, but here's the sort of way that you can use it. So you might ask a management team, "Where are we, guys?" And they might say, well, "You know, we're here. We've got an operational collaboration. In other words, we, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're working efficiently, but we want to move in this direction towards more of a business-level collaboration, which may mean sharing more information. It may even mean you know sort of even you know, to some extent working." Uh, almost on a joint supply model, uh, so there are lots of forms that can take. Okay, so usually firms are looking to move to the right, but here's something else that's really interesting. Having used this type of model with um, customers before, so I say to a, a client, "Where are you on this continuum?" And they might let's say that they just they, they say, "Oh, we're here. We're uh, you know business collaboration," and then I go and speak to some of their Suppliers say, "Well, what's it like working with this company?" They say, well, "You know, well, basically, we're kind of here. You know, basically, they just phone someone. They need something. They moan when it's late. They always try to drive the price up. There's no collaboration at all. So perceptions vary between the different players in the supply chain, and that in itself is very informative. And when you then go and feed that back to the client, come and say, "Well, you know, you, you think you've got a collaboration. Your suppliers don't think that." And, and then you begin to surface some of the thoughts on that relationship. Very often, somebody might think, "Well, but you know, there are suppliers. You know, we're the customer. The customer's king." Well, maybe, but is that really a constructive relationship? Is that what's going to get the best out of your relationship with your supplier and ultimately give you the best service you can deliver to your customer? So, I'm largely of the view that we should be trying to move in this direction you know, from left to right more towards partnerships in most cases. It does kind of depend what happens at industry level. And um, uh, I know quite a lot of people work in the advertising industry. And a lot has happened in that industry uh, post credit crunch. It's one of the things advertising is one of the things that gets cut, along with things like trading and consultancy when there's a downturn. Uh, there's a shift to digital, which I think companies in that industry are still getting to grips with. And there was a long period of time, and some of my, my friends that worked in that industry really suffered. And clients more or less drove them into the ground. And I, I can think of a, a number of businesses that they, they used to have a collaboration or perhaps even almost a partnership. And then it just became, you know, it's almost like it was moving more towards the left. In other words, they became less of a valued partner and more of a commodity. Do you know, if you don't do it, we'll get someone else to do it because there was overcapacity in that industry. Okay, so there's a lot to think about there. In general industry conditions, end user demand, and a whole host of other factors can impact upon these supply relationships. But if you clear away the things that I've put there and literally just take that as a, as a sort of a canvas, ask yourself, where are we, and where do we want to be on this continuum? And once we've answered that question, maybe, just maybe, you go and speak to your suppliers 
to where do you think we are on this continuum and see if you guys are on the same page. I'd be almost willing to bet you're probably not. You're probably not. But that's to find out. And that's one of the values of a tool like this. There's another one, and again, again you know, just relatively quickly. This was a, a supply chain initiative that took place in 2011. Basically, principles of good supply chain relationships. I'm not going to delve into a lot of detail here, but it's almost just like a check. It's almost like a health check. Okay, so you you know you want to improve your uh, supply chain relationships. Maybe as we said, you know you want to move from operational to business collaboration, for example. How do we do that? Well, this is quite a useful tool to help you achieve that. The basic principles are, you know, fair dealing, freedom of contract, keeping the consumer front and centre in your mind. You know, foremost in, in the sort of equation. And, and, and to be honest, all these other areas are important. I'm not going to delve into each one in detail, but we mentioned, for example, the importance of information sharing. Now, for me, a really efficient supply chain does need to share information, but it's commercially sensitive, it's commercially valuable. That creates a challenge and a potential problem. And I mentioned also risk. So often, smaller firms take the risk on behalf of their clients. Are they comfortable with it? Are they getting paid adequately for it? Is it a fair relationship? Okay, so you go back to the point of fair dealing. So there you have basically a pretty simple model that really could be very valuable if you take it to your company. And maybe what you do is you say, look guys, let's, let's set up a project. We'll, we'll just run this like an audit. And let's see how well we're doing in each of these areas. Let's benchmark ourselves, get to these areas, and see where we can improve. Okay. Yeah, I, I, what I like most is just put up a challenge there. So theoretically, it's wonderful, but how realistic is it? Can companies bother with it? I think that's a really, really good point. And I think my, my answer would be they've got a day job to do, probably 10 other projects on the, or, you know, either you know, in play or on the horizon. That's a very good challenge. I would argue that at the end of this course, if you were to do this course, you might decide, am I going to make the case for such an activity, you decide. And as uh, Janet's saying, you know, you could lose customers if you don't. Okay, but again, you know, good challenge, Boston. Ab absolutely, that um, <laughs> we, we have a day job. We've got all this other stuff going on. It's not obviously not a bad thing to do. And I know companies that use this model really to very good effect. And sometimes it's just going through it. And there's just maybe two or three areas. You know, maybe it's something to do with compliance. Um, Maybe it's something around, you know, there's risk as an area that just happens to interest me, etc. Okay, but yeah, good challenge as well. So, anything missing, you know, is anything that particularly stands out as being interesting? Is there anything missing from that? Any comments or questions at this stage? Let's maybe just focus on this first one. Is there anything standing out as being Interesting. You just use the chat box or come to the mic if you prefer. So one people, one or two people are typing. And just any thoughts or comments at this stage would be interesting. Hello, Mark. Hi. Um, I was just uh, thinking that. Uh, one of the challenges, I should imagine, if you, with the supply chain, is if you have to, um, if you're relying on an outside, outside in um, sort of person, what, what would yeah. you do, sort of, if you found you had a fa failing link? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a few responses to that. For me, ultimately, that comes back to the relationships. Okay, if there's a good relationship in place. For me, that's central to you know, creating those strong links. A slightly more uh, systematic approach is to introduce different forms of appraisal. So one of the um, things I've done you know, fairly often in my career is help confirm my, uh, what you might call it, let's call it a vendor appraisal system or a vendor rating system. So all you do is you just say, well, we're going to monitor supply time, you know, what percentage of suppliers on time, the right quantity, the right product, etc., and just monitor and feed that back to the customer. So that system, that flow of information is part of it, but I also think, you know, for me, the relationship side of it is increasingly important. And you kind of know when you've got a good relationship, you know when you've got a bad relationship. So, 
So that's my, that's my initial thoughts on that. There are, there are, there are probably more. Thank you, Mark. We've got a few questions coming in from Mark. Would you like me to read them? Please, yeah. Uh, Mark said it might be essential towards the end of life of a service if there's only one remaining supplier and the service can't yeah. be stopped. Yeah, absolutely. Then the power shifts. And again, one of the things we talk about exploring this module is you know, different power relationships. You know, there's a difference between you know, one very big customer and lots of small suppliers. The dynamic is very different for you know lots of small customers and one big supplier. You know, so so if you think about the BBA three five concept of appropriation, you know, who when, when the product is sold, who gets the lion's share of that money, it really depends on the power within the supply chain. Yeah, Athena says the uh, bullwhip effect and how to manage this interests yeah. her. Um, I think there's always a trade off either yeah. way. No, absolutely, and, and, and getting that right is a real challenge. And uh, I mean, the, 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 you know, there are formula you can use. And there's, there's a wonderful tool called we don't use it on this course, but there's a wonderful tool called exponential smoothing, which is making sense of variations in demand. And it's kind of mathematically easy to do. I'm still not convinced it really does deliver uh, the kind of benefits that uh, you might. It, it doesn't eliminate the bulbip effect by any means. It might temper it a little bit. Um, but yes, I think that's a very good point, Sam, absolutely. And Jan has said, uh, how can smaller suppliers protect against vertical integration by bigger players? That's yeah. a very good point. Yes, and uh, my, my gut feel is to say I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, some people might talk, I don't know if you've ever read the, the book, uh, Blue Ocean Strategy, and it's about making yourself so distinct, so important. That people can't, you know, you, you, you people can't really compete with you, and your suppliers, so your customers can't compete without you. Um, again, it's one of these nice ideas that's very difficult to, to to apply in practice. I think it's I think it's extremely difficult. Sometimes uh, suppliers might might form buying groups. They might even look at mergers and so on to increase their market power. Um, but generally, it, the bigger players do dominate the market, and it's a trend we've been seeing for generations now I suppose. It's not, it's not to say there's nothing you can do but I, I'm a bit of a sort of fatalist in this regard. I believe ultimately that scale does win over and I, I do hope that this sort of idea of localization, think global like local type of thing, I do, I do hope that will I think, can continue to gain traction. I mean, great questions. You know, I'm sorry, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily have a hard and fast answer but these are the sort of things that you know, we can explore in this course. Thank you, Mark. I'm aware that we're running yeah. short of time, so I don't know if you want to move on. Yeah, um, it just really it was open up for sort of questions and discussion. Um, if there are any other points you'd like to raise just now, I'd be very happy to address them as far as I can. Equally, you know, guys, if, you know, if you're you know, driving home or, or you're a bit later and you have a question, please do just contact me or, or contact uh, Janet, and, and you know, we'll be very happy to sort of get back to you with any sort of thoughts and questions. Thank you, Mark. That's very helpful. Um, I also might ask you um, uh, rather cheekily for um, some um, information on the book you mentioned, The Blue Ocean Strategy, oh, yes. okay. and I can let people know. And if you think of any other um, good reading, um, further reading, that oh, would be good. wonderful too. I've got, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a really uh, fairly comprehensive reading list, but um, yeah, a Blue Ocean Strategy, I, I mean, I just can probably pop the link in just now. Um, I, I don't have to say I don't I don't fully fully sort of agree with um, everything this particular book says, but it's it's very very it's very very popular. But you can probably just go away and Google this and find it on you know Amazon or whatever your preferred. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Well, I don't think we have any more. Oh, uh, don't think we have any more questions. Thank you for putting that up. Um, so I think as we've come to the end of time, I'll just wrap it up by saying thank you all very much for coming tonight. Thank you for Mark. I found it really, really interesting. Um, and you, uh, I will be sending out the recording and some links um, soon after this event. So thank you very much, everybody, and good yeah, night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Appreciate it, and have a good evening. Thank you.